Open your Bibles to Psalm 145 this afternoon. Psalm 145. And while you're turning there, in 1991, right here in this auditorium on that platform, on Thursday night, Brother Copeland was introducing me to speak and he got ready to walk off the platform before he reached the steps. He turned around and said, wait a minute, Jerry, before you start, uh, the word of the Lord's come to me. And he began to prophesy over me. And uh, I won't give you the entire prophecy. I have it transcribed. It's in my office. But part of it was God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry in the office of the seer. It has, a, has to do with the prophetic ministry. And he said, he's going to begin to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them wherever he might send you. And so from that moment, I have set time aside, usually in the month of October, and asked the Lord, what's on your agenda for the coming new year? And every year since that time, he's given me a prophetic word that I have preached all over America, all over the world, wherever he has sent me. And I don't change that subject until next year. And if I don't hear from him then, I just keep preaching it the following year. But every year he's given me a fresh word that I have emphasized. And uh, this past October, he did the same thing. But just before I get into that, let me just give you some of the titles of those prophetic words since 2010. Um, that's about as far back as I asked my secretary to look and see. I have them all in my notes. They're all in the archives now. But in 2010, the word of the Lord was above and beyond. The year for above and beyond. 2011, a year of supernatural increase. 2012, the year of fulfillment. 2013, the year of unprecedented favor. 2014 will be known as the year of the greater. 2015 will be known as a year of visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations. 2016, the year of the great breaking loose. 2017, the faithful shall flourish. 2018, days of glory, days of abounding. 2019, marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. 2020, a year of the supernatural. 2021, the year of abundant overflow. And then in 2021 of October, he said 2022 would be known as the year of the open hand of God. Unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision. And here we are in 2022. And I have been decreeing everywhere I've been to begin to expect to experience the open hand of God. There are two specific uh, things referring to the hand of God that I have discovered in the Bible. Uh, one of them, it is a reference to the right hand of God. The other one is a reference to the open hand of God. When you see a scripture talking about the right hand of God, it is usually uh, symbolic of his sovereign power, dominion, and authority. Uh, it was said that this is how God delivered the children of Israel out of bondage, by his right hand, by a mighty right hand, a powerful right hand. And then when you see the phrase, the open hand of God, it is usually symbolic of supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. And I think it's very interesting that God would say to me that 2022 would be a year of the open hand of God, particularly in times in which we live right now. Isn't it amazing? When the world is screaming worst of times, God is telling his people it could be the best of times. Can you say amen? amen? Now I've been preaching this, as I said, since October. I start out preaching it in our church and then I take it wherever the Lord sends me after that. And of course, every time I preach it, uh, I, I receive more insight into it. 
And I just keep preaching it and keep preaching it and pre keep preaching it. And the Lord gives me more and more insight. So I believe I'll just keep right on preaching it. Not only that, but it's working. Hallelujah. Amen. In fact, I ask the Lord every year when he gives me that prophetic word that I am to speak. And, and please understand, um, Brother Copeland laid hands on me some time back and said that I had entered into the prophetic office, but I'm not one who prophesies every time I open my mouth. I must be a minor prophet. <laughs> I don't know. It seemed like to me there's some folks every time you see them, I got a prophecy for you. I got a word for you. That's wonderful, but God doesn't use me that way. But when I hear from him, I know I've heard from him. Yeah. And once I hear from him, I'm, I'm bold to decree it. And then I ask him, I said, no, Lord, if you don't mind, would you confirm this word in me before I take it to the rest of the world? Because that way it'll give validity to it. Yes. Amen. Because God confirms his word with signs following. So in October the 1st, when the Lord said, tell the people to begin to expect the open hand of God. Now he did preface it with this. He said, tell them if they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is going on in the world today, then I will open my hand unto them and cause them to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. So notice there is a prerequisite. If they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder. Not one amen. amen. If they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is happening in the world around them, then tell them, I will open my hand and cause them to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Now, I always, once, once I receive that word from the Lord, the next thing I do is have my art department to put it uh, in some lettering and so forth. And we give every staff member a copy of it. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So he that reads it can run with it. In other words, keep it before them so they'll be motivated by it. Yeah. So I keep this in, in every notebook I've got, every Bible I carry around with me. I have it in my office. I have it in my home. I have it in my shop. I have it in my museum. I put it everywhere. I put it on the mirror in my bathroom. Not only that, but then uh, also we have these little bookmarks made and give everybody in the church a copy of it so that they can carry it around with them, read it uh, as often as they possibly can, and not only read it, but decree it every day. Tell them, I tell them, get up every morning decreeing that this is my year to experience the open hand of God. I will have extraordinary, supernatural, and unusual provision. Amen. And just keep decreeing it every day. Yes. Now, once again, I ask the Lord, uh, confirm this in me so that once I take it to the world, then I will have evidence that I've heard from you. Not only that, I'll have evidence that it works for those who will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is taking place in the world today. I learned a long time ago to not be moved by what I see. Amen. Not be moved by what I hear. Amen. Not be moved by what I feel. And the first person I ever heard say that was Kenneth Copeland in 1969. And the first time I heard him say it, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I feel. I thought, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was moved by everything I saw, moved by everything I, I heard, moved by everything uh, the way I felt. But I learned from him how to change that, praise God. And then I, I come across uh, the Apostle Paul saying these words in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He was telling the people there, he said, everywhere uh, I go, the Holy Spirit has told me in advance to expect opposition, to expect uh, uh, 
challenges, adversity. And then the next words out of his mouth was, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. I stood up in my bedroom that morning. I was probably three months old in the Lord, 1969. And I held that up and I said, God, I'm going to get to the place where I can say like the apostle Paul, none of these things move me. Well, that didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in a matter of a few weeks, but it happened. And I am not moved. I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what's happening in the world around me. I'm only moved by what I believe. I believe the word of God. So therefore, so be it. Amen. The end. Hallelujah. It's time to praise God. Amen. How many of you can say, I am not moved? <clears throat> say it boldly and say it loud. I am not moved. Say it one more time. I am not moved. Now look at somebody and say, I'm a candidate for the open hand of God. And why don't you go ahead and praise him in advance. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. Now let's look at Psalm 145 and lay a foundation for this. And then we'll continue talking about it throughout the week. In verse eight, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all. I don't know where you come from, but all in Texas means no exceptions. The Lord is good to all. Amen. Now, of course I am his favorite, but you come a close second and he's good to you too. Hallelujah. Now I know he's no respecter of persons, but he's been so good to me. He makes me feel like I must be his favorite. I'm the only one who preaches in Guadalcanal who does not get bugs in their mouth. Because I have favor. I got, I got so tickled. Those bugs were swarming, Brother Copeland, like crazy. And they really ganged up on Jesse. And then the last night I preached, wasn't a bug in the sky. Hallelujah. I walked off the platform. I said, favor. <laughs> Amen. So the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. Drop down to verse 14 uh, for the sake of time. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Now notice the phrase in the next verse, thou openest thine hand. We're talking about the open hand of God. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Yes. Notice it's talking about provision, supernatural provision, extraordinary provision, unusual provision. Amen. And you're a candidate for it if you make the decision that you will not be moved by everything that's going on in the world around you today. Amen. Now, one of the first things you're going to have to do is turn the television set off. Put the newspaper down. Amen. Thank God for Victory Network. <laughs> Amen. Because all you're going to hear on that network is faith. Even the news is faith-based. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful to have something that you can actually watch and walk away being inspired and not feeling dejected, depressed, and discouraged? Faith does not come by watching CNN. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now something does come by watching CNN all the time. Worry, fear, amen. So watch it less. Yeah, but I want to be informed. Well, what's wrong with this book? <laughs> CNN can only report what's happening right now. This book reports what's going to happen in the future. And read the back of the book, like Brother Copeland says, we win. <laughs> Amen. We win, praise God. So notice here, the Lord opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. So when you see the phrase, the open hand of God, 
It is usually symbolic of provision, supernatural provision. Now the Passion Translation reads this way. When you open your hand, it's full of blessings. When you open your hand, it is full of blessings. Amen. And who do those blessings belong to? You and me, praise God. We have a covenant with the Almighty. And when God makes covenant, it includes blessings. Amen. God told Abraham, I will bless you. Not only I will bless you, but the Amplified says, and I will give you an abundant increase of favor. So you can't have blessing without favor. Can't have favor without the blessing. They're synonymous. They go hand in hand. They're divinely linked together, praise God. So notice when God opens his hand, it is full of blessing. I I can't help but think of this. Uh, It comes to my mind every time I I state that translation. Years ago, uh, Carol and I were, I had just come home from a meeting and we were sitting in our den and I turned the television set on and Creflo was preaching. And I'm sitting there watching Creflo. Now this was many years ago. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I don't do that. I don't invite myself anywhere. People invite me to come. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I don't do that. I don't invite myself to preach anywhere. They invite me. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I'm already scheduled by invitation from Creflo to be in his church next month. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. Well, how many of you know you're not going to win an argument with God? So I called Creflo. I said, Creflo, you know me. I don't do this but I'm sitting here watching you on television and the Lord told me to call you and tell you I'll be in your church in the morning. He said, well, brother Jerry, you know, my house is your house. So if the Lord told you to be here, we'll be expecting you. He said, "Uh, let me know when you arrive. I'll have somebody pick up, uh, pick you up at the airport. I said, no, Creflo, I don't want an offering. I'll pay my own expenses. Uh, I'm just being obedient to God. He said, well, you're coming back next month, aren't you? I said, yes, I'll be back next month. He said, okay, well, we'll pick you up at the hotel. We'll at least make the hotel arrangements and, uh, and we'll be, expect to see you in the morning. So I got an airplane, flew to Atlanta and landed and they picked me up at the airport, took me to the hotel. Uh, I set my stuff aside and got all ready. And then I said, Lord, you said I had a word for Creflo's church. I'd like to know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm just being obedient to God. And uh, uh, so I prayed and and the Lord gave me a word. And so I went over there the next morning and I began to share that word. Now, Creflo and Taffy are sitting right on the front row. And of course, they they had two services at that time in the morning. And uh, so I was preaching the first service and then we were going to uh, take a break and then come back out for the second service. So I'm preaching along there and I like to walk when I'm preaching. And I got over here to this aisle and there was a guy sitting about where you are, sir. Raise your hand right there that I'm pointing at. Sitting about where this gentleman is. And he got out on his chair like this. I thought, is that guy going to jump on me? So I went back over to this side and started preaching over here. <clears throat> In a little while, I forgot about that guy and I worked my way back over here. I stopped in front of Creflo and Taffy for a little bit and then I got back over and the guy did it again. (laughs) I thought, surely the usher is not going to let him jump on me. So I I got back over here, preach a while and then I forgot about him again and I walked over here and this time he jumped up out of the aisle while I was preaching and ran toward me. And I thought, I didn't know what's going to happen. I didn't know if he was mad. I didn't know if he was glad. And he ran up to me and put a hundred dollar bill in this pocket right here and then went and sat down. So I walked over to Creflo. I said, Creflo, apparently he got here late for the tithes and offerings 
uh, put this in the offering. He said, no, that's yours. I said, no, I told you I wasn't going to receive an offering while I'm here this time. He said, no, he wanted you to have that. It's yours. Well, I'm not through with my sermon. I don't want to argue with Creflo. So I just stuck it back in my pocket and then I kept preaching. And then four or five people got up and started doing the same thing. And they, they just totally interrupted me. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. And they kept putting money in my pockets. And, and I kept trying to give it to Creflo and he wouldn't take it. In fact, he was laughing. And so I just kept preaching. And finally, people got up and surrounded me. You couldn't even see me anymore. And every one of them were putting money in my pockets, in my shirt. They stuck it down in my shoes. They, they stuck it in every pocket. They put it in my hands. They put it on the podium. They put it in my Bible. And then everywhere I walked, I, I, I left a trail of money falling out of my <laughs> pockets and my pants and everywhere. And a man got up, an usher got up and had a black trash bag and he was picking it up and putting it in the bag. And I'm trying to give the bag to Creflo and he won't take it. So we went back to the... Uh, the speaker's room. And and I said, Creflo, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never had anything happen like this before. I said, please put this in your offerings. He said, no, that's yours. The people wanted you to have it. I said, I've never experienced anything like this before. He said, I hadn't either, but it's just a sovereign move of God. And so we went out for the second service. Now, most of the people in that second service were not in the first. It started happening all over again. They, they totally shut me down. I couldn't preach anymore. <laughs> and this man is following me with a trash bag. I put it in the bag. And then when we got back to the speaker's room after that service, uh, I said, Creflo, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know how to handle this. He said, just receive it. The, the Lord wanted you to have it. They, the people wanted to bless you. He said, and when you come back next month, the, the, the church is going to give you an offering, but, but this is for you and Carolyn. Take it home to you and Carolyn. Oh, he included Carolyn. <laughs> now up to now, up to now, I learned from Jesse, it's she money. She don't know I got it. She ain't getting it. <laughs> That's what Jesse calls she money, right? She money. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, I got ready to to walk out and Creflo said, "Uh, can you stay for lunch? I said, yeah, I can stay for lunch. He said, mama's cooked. I said, oh, definitely I'm staying for lunch. If mama's cooked, his mama can cook. Southern style. I feel sorry for folks that's raised in the North. You don't know what, you don't know what Southern style is. Praise God. And I ate and I ate and I ate. And, And Creflo's mother walked over him. She said, Creflo, I don't think Carolyn's feeding that little white boy. (laughs) That boy can eat. (laughs) I said, pass the chicken, please. (laughs) And then I got ready to walk out and they were going to take me back to the airport. And the guy with the black trash bag followed me out. Creflo said, take this home. It's yours. So they put it in the car and I'm, I'm driving, they're driving me to the airport and I've, and I've got this trash bag full of money. I don't know how much. And, and the Lord said, you've just experienced the open hand of God. Now this, this is way before the Lord gave me this prophetic word regarding this year, but he was teaching me that when God opens his hand, you can expect supernatural, unusual, and extraordinary provision. See, I'd never experienced anything quite like that before. So now it's extraordinary, beyond the norm, unusual. Amen. Not only that, but it was full of blessing. It was full of blessing. Everybody that, that, that God used that morning had a blessing in their hand to put in my life. Okay. So when we got to the airport, my pilots were waiting for me and, and they gave me that trash bag and they gave my pilots the luggage and and I, I'm carrying the trash bag on the plane. 
<laughs> and my pilot said, Brother Jerry, would you like me to throw the trash away? I said, keep your cotton picking hands off my trash bag. <laughs> now that's Southern talk, amen. <laughs> and, and he was surprised, because usually if I have any trash, I give it to him, he gets rid of it before I get on the plane. And uh, I said, keep your hands off my trash bag. And I put it in the seat in front of me. All the way home, I just flew home and, and, and couldn't stop thinking about that extraordinary experience. So when I got home, I just left my luggage in the car and I walked in the house with a trash bag. <laughs> Carolyn said, what are you doing with that trash bag? I said, you got to hear this. And I told her about it. And then I, I uh, uh, said, I, she said, well, how much is in there? I said, I don't have a clue. So we poured it out in the floor in my study and started counting it. Now I felt real weird, all this money in the floor in my house. I, I closed the blinds. <laughs> I didn't think, I didn't want anybody that happened to walk up, think I stole the offerings. <laughs> I didn't. You can ask Creflo, I didn't. <laughs> But it felt weird because usually, now, Eric travels with me. Joe travels with me. Joe's back here somewhere. Tony travels with me. I don't touch the offerings. The pastors that bless our ministry usually give it to one of these guys. They take it to the accounting department. If I happen to be alone, they would give it to me and I take it to the accounting department. But I, I, don't, I don't touch the offerings generally, okay? And I don't want anybody to ever think I've stole the offerings. So uh, we poured it out in the floor, started separating everything. And when we got through, it was $26,000. $26,000 in cash, all cash. So I put 13,000 over to Carolyn and 13,000 over to me because Creflo said it's yours and Carolyn's. She said, well, what are you going to do with yours? I said, I know somebody that's in great financial need right now, and this would go a long ways to help them. So I'm going to give my 13,000 to them. She said, that's the same thing I'm going to do. There's some people in the church that need some financial assistance, and I'm going to give it to them. Now, we didn't keep one dime of it. We, we just sold it uh, to people that were in need, okay? And the Lord blessed us afterwards with above and beyond, praise God. Amen. But what I'm saying is we experienced the open hand of God, yes. unusual, extraordinary, and uh, supernatural provision. Amen. And in, the, in other words, it, it came in a way that I couldn't make it happen myself. Don't limit God to what you can do. Amen. Amen. Let me try on this side of the auditorium. Amen. Don't limit God to what you can do. Yeah. Amen. If you limit God to what you can do, then you're going to stay in the ordinary. Yes. You're going to stay in the natural. But God is a supernatural God. He has ways of getting money into your hands and meeting your needs. He has ways that you couldn't dream up in a thousand years. I would have never dreamed up that scenario. It had never happened to me before, but God, amen. He was just demonstrating to me that it is possible. I remember one time right here in this convention, many years ago, Brother Copeland got through preaching one night. We all were going back to the hotel, Jesse and Kathy, uh, Happy and Jeannie Caldwell. I believe Pat Harrison was with us and Carolyn and I. And, and John Copeland, we were all in the elevator and the doors were closing. We all pushed what floor we were on. And just before the doors shut, two little hands came through, pushing through, trying to open the door. And I pushed the open button and the doors opened. And there was a lady standing there in a jogging suit. She didn't have a purse. She didn't have a Bible. She just looked like there might be somebody that was staying in the hotel, maybe went for a walk downtown Fort Worth. And, and uh, when I opened the door for her, she said, thank you, pushed the button for her floor. And we went on with our conversation about what Brother Copeland had preached in the meeting that night, discussing it, talking about it. And she got off on the floor uh, before hours 
And when the door opened, she turned to me and said, Brother Jerry, God told me this would happen here and handed me a check and walked off. The doors were closed almost before I could say thank you. And I got a check in my hand and inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> now, just before that convention started, I was building a medical facility in the nation of Kenya and I was paying cash for it as I went. And, and we, had, we had completed it, I had thought, and, and uh, Brother Oral Roberts and I were going over to dedicate it. He was gonna provide the doctors and nurses. I had built the facility, and uh, we were getting ready to go over and dedicate it. And my director called and said, uh, there's something else we need to do, and it's gonna cost X amount of dollars to get it done. And the natural, I didn't have any more money to invest in that project. I had money, but it was designated for other projects and I can't use it because that's misappropriating funds. And the IRS frowns on that. So I didn't have any more funds to invest in that project. And he told me what we needed. And that check was for that exact amount. Wow. That was unusual. That was supernatural. That was extraordinary. Can you say amen? God is good at that. How many of you can say, my God is good at that? <laughs> now, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever experienced provision in a supernatural way, in an unusual way, in an extraordinary way? Yeah. Would you like to experience it more? Yeah. Well, lift your hand and say, I'm a candidate. Okay. And give the Lord a shout in advance. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say this with me. To 2022. Is the, is the year of the open hand of God. Hand of God. I, will not I will not be moved by all the chaos by and all the disorder, all the disorder in the world around me. World. And I'm a candidate I'm a for supernatural, supernatural, extraordinary, supernatural. unusual provision. Amen. I receive it. And give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen. So when he opens his hand, it is full of blessings. One commentary states, and he pours those blessings out until satisfaction is produced. If your favorite song used to be, I can't get no satisfaction, <laughs> get a new favorite song, praise God. God will pour it out until satisfaction is produced. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to satisfy? To meet the expectations of. To meet the expectations of. Now take note of that word expectation. In the Amplified Bible, verse 15, let's look at it in the King James. The eyes of all wait upon thee. The eyes of all wait upon thee. In the Amplified Bible, it says this. The eyes of all wait for you. Looking, watching, and expecting looking, watching, and expecting. See, you need to get up every morning looking, watching, and expecting to experience the hand of God. Not just while you're in this meeting and then go home and forget about it. No, get up every day. Not only that, but, but decree it. Say it out loud. The apostle Paul said, quoting the psalmist in 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse 13. He says, as it is written, we believe, therefore have we spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. If you believe it, then talk it. Yes. You heard a great sermon about it from Brother Copeland this morning, another great sermon about it from Brother Keith, and then Brother Jesse touched on it as well. Sounds like to me, God is endeavoring to get across to us. If we want it, talk it. Yes. Amen. Amen. With the heart, Brother Keith told us, man believe it, but with the mouth is how you get from here to there. And he say amen. amen. So talk it. I get up every morning talking it. This is my day, another day for me to experience the open hand of God. I go to bed, last thing I say before I close my eyes, Lord, the Bible says you neither sleep nor slumber. 
That means you're going to be up all night. I'm human. I need some sleep. I'm going to sleep. Since you're going to be up all night, you dream up new ways to open your hand toward me. And when we, I get up in the morning, we'll talk about it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Be it, let it be the last thing on your mind before you close your eyes. Let it be the first thing on your mind and out of your mouth when you get up. Amen. Well, I tried that, Brother Jerry. Well, that was your problem. You tried. Do it. Do it. How many of you guys in here are married? Do you remember the ceremony? <laughs> Carol and I just celebrated 56 years of marriage. I remember the ceremony. The preacher asked me, do I take this wife, this, this woman to be my wife? I didn't say, I'll try. <laughs> That's not the right answer. The right answer is I do. If I'd have said, I'll try, Carolyn would have said, that's not the right answer. Tell him you do. <laughs> I've said this many times before. You've heard me say it. Many of you have. I was born with this dimple, but it got deeper when I got married. <laughs> this is where Carolyn grabs me and says, are you listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> you don't try marriage. It won't last. Right. If you do marriage, yeah, right. I mean, you got to do marriage. You can't try the Word of God. You got to do the Word of God. I can't find anywhere in there that says, God blesses the triers. God blesses the doers. The Bible says, don't be a hearer only, but a doer. How many doers are in the house this afternoon? Amen. God blesses people who do the Word. Can you say amen? So notice the eyes of all wait for you looking, watching, and expecting. It is a known fact that you get what you expect, good or bad, yes. negative or positive. Yes. The word expectancy is very closely associated to the word faith, real Bible faith. Jesus said, be it unto thee according to thy faith. He could have just as easily said, be it unto thee according to your expectancy. Because real Bible faith expects God to do something. If you're not expecting God to do something, then are you really in faith? Okay, I got to try this side over here again. <laughs> if you're not expecting God to do something, are you truly in faith? No. Faith expects. Yes. What, what's the sense of praying if you're not expecting results? Amen. Did anybody come here this week expecting results? Yes. Expecting to hear a word from God? Yes. Expecting perhaps healing? Expecting a financial breakthrough while you're here back home? Hallelujah. Yes. If you don't expect something, then just stay in bed. <laughs> Amen. So notice once again, looking watching and expecting, expecting. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. These confessions are getting weaker and weaker. Say it again. I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. Don't let it, don't let it fizzle out. <laughs> say it boldly, hallelujah. I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. And if you're truly expecting it, then demonstrate it with a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Real Bible faith expects God to do something. The definition of expectancy is anticipation with confidence of fulfillment. Anticipation with confidence of fulfillment. Amen. I believe what God says. Therefore, I expect it to come to pass. In fact, because I expect it to come to pass, I don't walk around with my head down. I don't walk around with a sad face. I walk around with joy. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, if God said it, then we have every right to expect it to happen because God is not a man that he should lie. 
If God says that he will open his hand and cause us to experience unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision, then who has the right to prevent us from expecting it? Amen. I'm not interested in what anybody else has to say about it. I'm not going to let anybody talk me out of it. And I'm certainly not going to go to a church that's full of unbelief and tell me it's not for me today. It is for me today. It is for you today. Hallelujah. In fact, it can happen this week while you're right here in this convention. Praise God. Amen. Now, Job chapter 22, verse 28, you all know it. At least you've heard it. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. The word established means confirmed, made firm and brought about. In other words, if you decree it, then God will establish it. He will bring it about. He will cause it to manifest. In the literal Hebrew, the word is uh, translated established in English literally means if you say it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence. If you say it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence in your life. Amen. So that means just saying it while I'm leading you in it in an afternoon service in the Believer's Convention in Fort Worth is not enough. What are you saying when you leave here? Woe is me. Oh dear God, did you hear what CNN said today? No, I didn't and I don't want to. I'm decreeing what God says. Amen. Don't just decree it while you're here. Say it continually. This is my year to experience the open hand of God. Psalm 35 verse 27 says, let them say continually. Let them say continually. Let them say continually. Continually means unceasing. It didn't say let them say once. Let them say continually. Amen. How many of you wives like to hear continually your husband tell you he loves you? Do you enjoy him saying, I told you when I got married, I hadn't changed. (laughs) That wouldn't go over well with my wife. She likes to hear it. In fact, many times she says, have I told you today I love you? I say, uh, yes, you have. And I love you too. Sometimes I try to beat her to it. Did I say today that I love you? Yes. Well, I want to say it again. And, and, if, and if she says, did I tell you today I love you? And I say, well, no. She says, well, I'm telling you now. Yeah. Seemed like there was an old song about that. Yeah. Have I told you lately that I love you? Yeah. Well, darling, I'm telling you now. Yeah. I should have been a recording artist. Yeah. I, don't, I, I can't sing, but I can remember all the words. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right. Say it continually. Look at your neighbor and tell him, say it continually. Amen. Not just once. Talk it all the time. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 104, verse 28, thou openest thine hand and they are filled with good. His hands are filled with good. Why? Because God is good. Everything about him is good. He's the author of good. Amen. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen. That's the reason I know Cajun food came from heaven. It's good. (laughs) Amen. Did you bring me some gumbo yaya? Okay, I'll come home. Kathy makes some good gumbo and she's of God because he's good. Hallelujah. Everything he does is good. Now the passion translation says for Psalm 104 verse 28, 
He satisfies from his abundant supply. He satisfies from his abundant supply. God is not stingy. Amen. God is not stingy. Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice he does exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. The Amplified Bible even adds this phrase that we dare to ask and dare to think, dare to pray, dare to, to uh, believe. I, I hear God issuing a dare, a challenge to ask him for something that in the natural seems impossible. Ask him for something that in the natural is improbable. Ask him for something that in the natural other people say will never happen. God says, whatever you can ask, I'm bigger than that. Whatever you can think, I'm bigger than that. I dare you to ask me for something impossible. Can you say amen? amen? So God is the God that does exceeding abundant above all that we can ask or think. If you can think it, he can do it. If you can ask it, he can make it happen. One more translation says, the Lord opens his hand and gives bountifully all things to enjoy. Gives bountifully all things to enjoy. A lot of people have problems with people that are enjoying the blessings of God. You know, nobody talked ugly about me when I didn't have anything. Nobody wrote an ugly book about me when I had nothing. But once the blessing started coming, once the blessing started coming, there's, there's, uh, we, we've lived out in the country all these years and now Fort Worth has grown our way and all these houses are being built around us. And uh, when that first started a few years ago, there was a guy moved in in one of those houses and he'd drive by my house. If I happened to be out in the front yard, he's in an old pickup, he'd roll the window down and he'd scream, hey preacher, did you steal the money to build that house? Then he'd drive off real fast. Never give me an opportunity to respond. And then one day I was out there and I, I, you know, before I went in the ministry, I restored classic cars and, and my dad raced automobiles. I gave all that up when I went in the ministry, but then God gave it back to me and said, turn what once was your passion into a tool for evangelism. And so, uh, I, I have the classic cars and the, and the motorcycles and hot rods and I use them as tools. We win people to the Lord all over the world. Our chariots are like Christian bikers will turn 25 years old. I started it 25 years ago and we have kept a record of the salvations. Over 460,000 people have come to Christ just through the motorcycle ministry. So if you got a problem with motorcycles, get over it. And if you got a problem with me having a motorcycle, get over it. Don't let the suit fool you. I'm cool. Yay. I ride a bad Harley and a bad Indian and a bad Triumph. You mean you have more than one? Yeah. I open my hand and give bountifully all things to enjoy. Now, before you run off and get mad at me, Ask my wife how many of them I've given away. Ask my wife how many cars I've given away. How many hot rods, classic cars I've given away. She told me one time, don't you ever give another motorcycle away. I said, why not? She said, they come back to you in fleets and we have to build another garage. I, I was on a tour this year in May. I've always wanted to do, my, my heritage is Cherokee Indian on my mother's side. And, and I've always wanted to do a motorcycle tour on the Trail of Tears, follow the Trail of Tears, all the way from Cherokee, North Carolina, all the way to Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Now I had, I had ancestors that lived on the Cherokee reservation in Tahlequah on my mother's side. 
And I've always wanted to follow that. So we, we did our motorcycle tour uh, in May and started in Cherokee, North Carolina and spent uh, about nine or 10 days just following the Trail of Tears all the way to Tahlequah. Now, before we got to Tahlequah, uh, we, we had a day off and, and uh, we stopped at a Harley dealership, no, an Indian dealership that was in this particular town before we got to the hotel. And we all went in just to look at the new bikes. And, and I walked over to one new Indian and it was beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. And I sat on it and it felt good. <laughs> and a pastor that, that oversees our ministry in South Africa and has worked for me for over 25 years, I guess, he came on that tour. He wanted to be on that specific tour. So he came uh, over from South Africa and he saw me sitting on that bike. He said, Brother Jerry, you look good on that bike. I said, yeah. Uh, he said, do you like that bike? I said, yeah, what's not to like about this bike? He said, well, I have a surprise for you. He said, the church in South Africa sent me here to be on this tour and they also said, if Brother Jerry comes across something during that tour that he really likes, we're giving you an offering to buy it for him. He said, Brother Jerry, I brought an offering. How much does this bike cost? I asked the salesman. He told me and he says, we got enough to buy it and some left over. Amen. Every time God opens his hand, there is a bountiful supply. Well, nothing like that ever happens to me. Well, maybe it's because of your ugly attitude. <laughs> okay, let me try on this side now. <laughs> attitude has everything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. In aviation, your attitude determines your altitude. And the same thing is true in the natural. Your attitude determines how high you go in the things of God, how high you go in the blessings of God. Amen. So don't get mad at me for having more than one motorcycle. Like Jesse said, it's not my fault. It's God who said, I will open my hand. And what did it say in this translation? And I give bountifully all things to enjoy. Now, when you've won 460,000 people to Christ with a motorcycle, then criticize me. Until then, don't worry, be happy. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, let me close it with this. Tomorrow, I want to share with you some ways that you can position yourself to experience the open hand of God. There's a scripture in the Bible that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 26. And it talks about showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. Another translation says, a downpour of blessings. A downpour of blessings. You ever been in a downpour? You know, people up in Kentucky, we're praying for them that are experiencing that flooding up there. And, and if you've ever been in a flood, um, I mean, sometimes you just have to ride the thing out. You know, we've had downpours here in Texas before. One time years ago, a downpour for days and days and days, and it come up in our house and, and Carol and I are, are putting uh, towels and everything under the door seals and, and everything, and it didn't help at all. The water just kept seeping in. Finally, I just sat on the floor and laughed. I couldn't stop it. Yeah. I just sat on the floor and laughed. <laughs> I couldn't stop it. When God causes showers of blessings, you can't stop it. Yeah. You just have to lift your hands and laugh, hallelujah, and rejoice. Praise God. Amen. Showers of blessing. Now, uh, I'm going to leave you with this, and then we'll get uh, lay this as a foundation for tomorrow. There's one commentary 
the Benson commentary that says this about Ezekiel 34, 26. I will give you remarkable instances of my favor and the joy and the happiness which flows from it. And there shall be blessings in great abundance. Remarkable instances of my favor and remarkable, unusual blessings. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you tomorrow about two predominant ways, actually three predominant ways that you can position yourself to experience the open hand of God are three predominant ways in which they manifest. For additional messages by Jerry Savelle, come tomorrow. Yeah. Did I whet your appetite? Praise God. All right, let's stand to our feet and let's bless the Lord before we dismiss here. Praise God. Hey, I didn't keep you very long. Hallelujah. So do you receive that today? Yeah. Lift your hands and shout, I receive it. I receive it. I'm looking for it. I'm, for it. I'm watching for it. I'm watching and for it. I'm expecting it. And turn around and look at somebody and show them what you do when you're expecting something from God. Amen.